Um, I'm going to finish the second half of it, as you see here, verses 22 through 31. Last week, as you remember, this was a very interesting psalm. It had a lot of uh, prophecy in it, prophecy about what took place on the cross. It started out as David wrote in verse 1 of Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that was a saying which Jesus spoke of on the cross. And we looked at a, a lot of the prophetic statements that were made in those first verses. In the second half of the psalm, there doesn't seem to be that many prophetic statements. So I'm kind of changing a little bit. We're not going to look at fulfilled prophecy in it. We're going to look at David as he wrote this, what he might have been going through, what happened, etc. So uh, kind of a little bit of change in that. We're going to cover verses 22 through 31 today. But first, I know, I just found some silly, some, some dumb riddles. I thought they were kind of comical, but here we are. How, what do, how, do I, how do astronomers organize a party? You like this one. You ready? They plan it. Ha, 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 ha. They plan it. I like that. Did you hear about the kidnapping at school? Are you ready for this? He's, it's okay. He woke up after class. <laughs> yeah, you don't get that one right away. Kidnapping at school. Yeah. I read it and I didn't see. What? I don't get it. Oh, I get it now. <laughs> Took me a few seconds. I'm not the smartest, you know. What do you call a bear with no teeth. A gummy bear. A gummy bear. You heard this one, all right? Yeah, a gummy bear. Man, yeah. man, a bear with teeth. Yeah. What happens to a frog's car when it breaks down? It gets towed away. <laughs> I like those. All right, let's go on. What does that have to do with the sermon? Nothing. Sometimes I get them to relate, but... Actually, in homiletics, you learn to draw the crowd in in the opening part there. So I hope you got drawn in with those. Yeah. All right. All right. Here's the text. We're going to read through the text uh, this week, and then I'm going to break it up and uh, look at our outline. Seven-point outline. I practiced it at home, and, I, and I, had a, I, I cut it all the way down to four hours. So we'll be out of here by three this afternoon. No. All right. Here we are, starting at verse 22. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. That sounds an awful lot different than verse 1, doesn't it? Yeah, we got a sudden change in this psalm. We'll talk about that. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. I like that. The affliction of the afflicted. And he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in, my, in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who hear him. There's a promise from David. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nation shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. None of us can keep ourselves alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to the people yet unborn that he has done it. All right. That ends the reading of the scripture. So let's look at this. Here's our outline. I tried to, this is, a, you know, sometimes it's real easy to get somebody else's outline. This is all my work. I sat down, I divided the verses up, summarized the verses, tried to come up with a word, tried to uh, alliterate the word. So the, my seven P's this morning, praise, prayer, promise, pleasing, propagating, prosperous, posterity there there isn't that a good outline we'll try to work our way through uh, as quickly as we can okay so let's jump into our seven p's for this morning first one praise you remember verse one david as he writes it remember what was the word we used last week huh? over exaggerated he says oh my god my god why have you forsaken me david 
David was just distraught. The Lord wouldn't answer his prayer. He was having a problem, and the Lord just wouldn't answer his prayer. In those first verses, his, his bones were all out of joint, and life was just horrible because the Lord wouldn't answer his prayers. And now, all of a sudden, in verses 22 and 23, the whole psalm changes, and he says, I will tell your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I'm going to jump up and I'm going to, I'm adding a little bit there. I'm going to jump up and I'm going to praise you all over the place. David got his prayer answered apparently in here. Isn't that interesting? David, David was a very emotional man. You realize that. He lusted after Bathsheba. and he, uh, When the Lord wasn't answering his prayer, we don't know what situation in life he was, he was going through when he wrote this psalm, but it was just the most horrible, horrible thing in the world as God had forsaken him. And now all of a sudden the Lord answers his prayers and he is going to go in the midst of the congregation of all of Israel, and he's going to praise the Lord. Aren't we somewhat that way? Now, some of us are pretty, are, maybe aren't as emotional as what David was. You know, we're pretty stable and level. But, but aren't we all somewhat the same way when we think, things aren't going right. Oh, it's the worst thing in the entire world. And then all of a sudden the Lord does something right in our eyes. You know? The Lord answers a prayer or we recognize an answer of prayer. And then we're all happy and we're all praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. How great this is. I think we ought to be, I think even when the Lord isn't answering our prayer, we need to recognize him as Lord and praise him anyway, huh? And then he goes on, he says, you who fear the Lord, praise him, all you offspring of Jacob, offspring of Jacob. He's talking to Israel here because later he's going to expand that, not just to Israel, but to the whole world should be praising the Lord. He says, you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. So David is now praising the Lord, and he invites, he, he, I, I kind of chuckle because if he, he's before the congregation of the righteous, all right? He's standing before all the brothers of Israel, and he's saying, I'm going to praise the Lord. You people ought to praise the Lord. Well, just a few verses before that, David was saying, oh, my God has forsaken me. You know, it's almost, it's almost comical, the emotional flip-flopping that he is doing we in the midst when things are going well it's easy for us to praise the lord and rejoice in him and spend time in prayer and say thank you lord but we're in the midst of problems that all get set aside and we mope you like that word mope my wife always says i mope what are you are you moping again you don't know what kind of a person I would be without my wife. She straightens me out a lot, I'll tell you. You husbands recognize that probably. But, uh, yeah, we get down in the mouth and we think, oh, God's abandoned me. What did I do to cause the Lord to abandon me? You know, and we're just down in the mouth. We need to praise the Lord anyway. huh? All right, let's go on. Praise, prayer. He had prayed to the Lord. The Lord seemingly didn't answer him when, when David thought it wanted, he wanted it answered. But now the Lord comes through. He says this, For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. He's talking about afflicted people himself, but others as well, going through hard times, whether they're uh, without food, he's going to talk about them being satisfied in just a verse or so. People are going through affliction. David says, the Lord sees when you are in the midst of affliction. The Lord has not despised that. This isn't that the Lord hates you and he's dumping garbage down on you and your life. He has not hidden his face from him, but has heard. I like that phrase. If you walk out of here with a phrase from this sermon, I know most of it, you know, fall asleep because Mr. Herrick's not going to hold your attention. But, but this phrase, walk out of here with this phrase. 
He has not hidden his face from him, but has heard. Huh? But has heard. David was saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Had the Lord forsaken him? No. God was there. It was all in God's timing, but has heard when he cried to him. At this point, I went to a website. I typed into Google, uh, stories of answered prayer. And I actually, I don't know that I'm going to read them. I actually printed off a number of them. It was a site that had a whole bunch of people who send in testimonies about how they prayed about something and the Lord had answered their prayer. But the site started off with this. And I thought this was very good. Listen to this. Prayer is a complex phenomenon, and there are times in life when God seems not to answer our prayers involving very important issues, such as death or an accident of a loved one, a struggle, or a painful situation. These stories, meaning the stories that were, were listed on that page, these stories are not meant to simplify, wrap into a tidy package, or define how God works or his nature or explain why some people regularly receive answers to prayer while others do not. Though these persons may be equally as faithful to God, in some prayers the answers are instantaneous. But as we know, some prayers, some answers to prayers may come slowly and quietly after many years. Why will God answer a prayer for a lost item but seem quiet in the face of tragedy? And then he says, such is the mystery of God. I thought that was good. We sometimes oversimplify prayer and we say, well, all you got to do is pray about it and God's going to hear and God's going to answer. But in real life, it's not that simple. God takes time when he feels the time is good. It's, he thinks it's good for us to be under pressure. So he doesn't answer right away. And there are times when we feel like David, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But God hasn't forsaken us. He is still there working. We don't understand all the intricacies of answered prayer. But the Bible tells us God answers prayer. All right, let's go on to the next item. I'm not real happy with this next point, this next P. Oh, answered prayer. Oh, yeah, I had a, I had a couple of cross-references. This was good. I, it's always interesting when I'm working on a sermon, and then I go to, I use my da our daily bread. Radio Bible class ministry here in the area has grown to be worldwide. It, it's just a phenomenal thing. And I always listen uh, online to it, and they had one about this. Answered prayer, Romans chapter 8, verse 26 says this. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes, that word intercedes can mean makes prayers for us, intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. So when we are praying, and maybe we don't know how to pray as perfectly as we ought, we don't know the exact will of the Lord as we go through this difficult time, but the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. Isn't that good? Ah, but wait. A couple verses later, verses 33 and 34. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, he was raised, who is at the right hand of God. Here it is who indeed is interceding for us. So right within a few verses of each other, when we pray, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, and the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who's at the right hand of God, intercedes for us. Isn't that a wonderful thing? I thought that, that, that was so exciting for me as I thought about that this week. God, the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ intercedes for us, and God always wants our best interest when answering our prayers. All right, next one. Oh, I got another one. I forgot. I stuck these cross-references in, but this is good. This is good. Old Testament answer the prayer. You remember the story, starting in chapter 1, about um, 
what was his name? Elkina was the husband. He had two wives, one had kids. Hannah didn't have any children. Well, one year, they would go annually up, uh, down to Shiloh, where the tabernacle was at. Um, and one year, Hannah went down with him. Uh, they had had a meal. After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now, Eli, the priest, remember, Eli was the priest there at that time, was sitting on a seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She, Hannah, was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. Now, I'm missing a few verses in, oh, verse 10, just a minute. No, I only had verse, no, verse 10, 9 and 10. I'm missing a few verses in the middle here. But you remember, Eli looked at her, and she was in there, and she was mumbling silently. And Eli thought what? You remember the story? Eli thought she was drunk. What's this woman coming into the tabernacle and praying before the Lord while she's drunk? And Hannah had explained, no, I'm just in agony of heart, she said. Well, down a few verses later, she is praying in distress and wept bitterly before the Lord, and the Lord remembered her. There it is. They got done. They went home, and the Lord remembered her. I, I, I got this started in the middle of a verse. The first part of the verse talks about how Elkinah knew his wife, and that word knew there is used in the biblical sense of knowing his wife. All right? And the Lord remembered her, and in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. Here we have a biblical example, wonderful example of God's answer to prayer. A woman who was so distressed that she was not having any children, and she went and she prayed, and the Lord heard her and granted her wish. All right, finally, point three, promise. Uh, coming from verse 25, I wanted to talk about that word satisfied. And I couldn't come up with a P word for satisfied. So I went to my trusty thesaurus. You know what a thesaurus is. A thesaurus is a book where you get synonyms. And there was a the word pleasing there. Satisfied is pleasing. But it really doesn't fit well. But it, it was a P, so I put it in there. Okay, just remember, I was trying to say satisfied. All right, here it is. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vow will I perform. No, wait. Oh, I'm sorry. I jumped. I jumped one, didn't I? How did I go there? Oh, I'm missing a point. I'll come back to this. There we go. Promise. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vow is performed before those who fear him. David, in that second part of that verse, says, you know, I made a vow to the Lord. And he says... I am going to perform it. Now, what does that imply about his fulfilling of that vow before that? Well, he had kind of put it off, probably. He had vowed to the Lord. He'd made a promise to the Lord. And up to this point, he, he hadn't fulfilled it. So now that the Lord has answered his prayer, now David says, okay, doggone it, I've been putting it off too long. The Lord is so gracious. The Lord is so good to me. Now I'm going to fulfill my vow. He's going to be obedient now. Let me ask you something. We should be obedient. Should we be obedient when the Lord answers our prayer? Yeah, yeah. Let me ask you something. Should we be obedient to the Lord when it doesn't seem like the Lord is answering our prayer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm wondering, and I don't, you know, David was a very godly man. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm putting my character on David. Was David not fulfilling his vow initially because he was a little bit mad at the Lord because the Lord wasn't answering his prayer? I know that's the way I would be. Well, okay, Lord, if you're not going to answer my prayer, I'm not going to fulfill my vow. I'm not going to be obedient to you. You know, that, I know we don't ever say that out loud, <laughs> but that's the way we act at times, isn't it? Now, David, the Lord is answering his prayer, and he says, you know, I shouldn't be that way. I'm going to fulfill my vow. I'm going to start being obedient to the Lord. Do what I'm supposed to do. All right, verse 4. Pleasing. That's the one I thought I was on. I went, to the, went, I, I went to the thesaurus and found that word pleasing as a synonym for satisfied. Listen to this verse. 
The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. So they were going through affliction. Possibly the crops had failed. They had nothing to eat. And they prayed about it. And the Lord came through and they were satisfied. You know, we in the United States don't know what it's like to go hungry. We in the United States are constantly, how do I want to say this? Outwardly, we are satisfied. I told you before, a lot of times I'm sitting there watching TV, and I'll, I'll, on Facebook they advertise for something on Amazon, and I quit go to Amazon, and oh, it'll be neat, and I buy it. Then I buy this, then I buy that. You know, uh, by the way, that, that light turning on thing from my app, I'm finding that very nice. Because instead of wandering to bed in the dark after turning all the lights off, I leave it on, I can go to bed in the light, and then at my bedside, I can turn that lamp in the living room off. I remember I told you about that a few weeks ago. Yeah, uh -huh. so it is useful. It is useful. We don't know what it is to want to be in need. And I wonder if that has caused us to be spoiled, and that we are never satisfied as we ought to be satisfied in the Lord. I want to read this to you. A beggar standing on a street corner commented to his friend, if only I had a hundred dollars, I would never complain again. Yeah, right, huh? A businessman walking by overheard his statement and interrupted the conversation. Excuse me, the man said, did you say if you had a hundred dollars, you would never complain again? The beggar replied, you heard me right, mister. The man pulled out his wallet, handed him a hundred dollars and said, I'm glad I can have a small part in bringing happiness to the world. After the man walked away, the beggar turned to his friend and remarked, I wish I had said two hundred dollars. Yeah. Never satisfied, are we? I can just see me fitting in that situation. Yeah, never satisfied. You know what? The Lord can satisfy our souls. Do you know why that we are never satisfied? One of the reasons we are never satisfied is a sin that is listed in the Ten Commandments. It's talked about in the New Testament quite often. It is the sin of covetousness. We are always wanting more than we have. And when we, and we live in a nation that is very prosperous and we've had a good lifestyle and it seems that we are always coveting the next new toy. Electronics have always, have always fascinated me and I'm always looking for that next new little electronic gadget that's come out. You know what happened a couple weeks ago? Apple advertised their iPhone 7. Ooh, 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 ooh. Well, I, I squelched <laughs> the desire in me to get rid of my 6, my 6 Plus, and quickly get a, a 7. I squelched that, but it was there. I wanted to get that, you know. Always, it seems that if I had $100, I'd be happy. Never complain again. And then as soon as we get it, I wish I'd have said 200. Yeah, we, we're, we're just like that. The Lord was satisfying these people. All right, let's go on. I got to watch my time. I have three more. Propagating. Propagating? What does that mean? Well, let's read those verses. All the ends of theirs shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nation shall worship before you, for kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over all nations. Propagating. Um, it was a P word that I came up with. Now, I believe that this is a prophecy. I kind of set aside the prophecies that we saw in the first half about the cross. But I believe this is talking about the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. You read the book of Revelations. I'm a, a, a premillennialist. I believe that there will be a literal thousand years on the earth when Jesus Christ will reign that's when this will be fulfilled. Jesus will be the king, literally ruling and reigning in Jerusalem for a thousand years. Though not all of man's hearts will be conquered by the end of that thousand years, Satan will be released and will be able to gather an army of rebellious people to gather and come against the Lord for one last time. But I believe that this will be fulfilled during the millennium. But in our age... 
we are to be bringing the gospel to the ends of the earth. You remember at the end of, at the end of all four gospels, and even in the book of Acts, we have different forms of it, but we have what is called the Great Commission. Here's the most well-known one, Matthew chapter 28. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples. It's a verb meaning disciplize. Make disciples. Make followers of me of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We are to be going out to all the world and bringing the gospel. Now, we immediately think, well, good, we'll send those missionaries out, we'll support the cooperative program so that others, so that missionaries can go out to the ends of the earth. By the way, I was reading uh, in missions... Um, there, do you realize that there is a field of study called missiology? There are, in many seminaries, missiologists who study missions and the movement of God and the spreading of the gospel. They have categorized all of the people groups throughout the world, and they, they believe that by 2027, all of the people groups of the world will have been brought the gospel. Jesus said that every nation and tribe would hear the gospel before the end. We are to be bringing the gospel to the ends of the earth. It was rather interesting as I was reading on that page, there are great revivals going on in China right now. The communists have, have persecuted the church for years, and there are great revivals breaking out among the underground church, many Chinese coming to know the Lord. In South America, there are great revivals that are going on. The biggest one that's going on most recently is among the Muslim countries. There is a, even though there is horrible persecution against the Christians, there is great revival going along among the Muslim countries today. God is working. He is bringing his gospel out there. We need to be propagating the gospel. I was going to say, we immediately think of yeah, sending missionaries to all the people groups of the earth. But what about your neighbor who has never heard the gospel? You know, that's our responsibility. That's our responsibility as a local church. That is your responsibility as a Christian. Going to the ends of the earth means the door next to you, the house next door to you, to bring the gospel to them. We need, as a local church, God has planted local churches for the gospel to be spread in that particular area. We need to be faithful in doing that. We fail in that so often. Listen to this. Now, my dad once told me a story about a peculiar fisherman from Minnesota. You see, this fisherman was very well prepared. He knew how to fish. He had everything you need to be a good fisherman. He had poles, nets, baits, and even a really nice boat. But this fisherman had a problem. You see, for all of his preparation, he never caught anything. Not one fish. Not one. Not ever. And you know why he never caught a fish? What do you think? The answer is easy. He never went fishing. He was always too busy with other things that he never took his boat out on the lake and went fishing. Yeah. We aren't very effective fishers of men, even though we may be trained and equipped and we know everything, but we don't do it. We just don't get out there and share the gospel. The gospel is going to go to the ends of the earth during the millennium. During this age, we are God's hands and feet to bring the gospel to the world. Go on. Prosperous. David takes a verse here, verse 29, as he comes near the end of this, to talk about, he talked about the afflicted. Now he talks about the prosperous. The prosperous who have a lot of things, who don't seem to have a lot of affliction in their life. He says this, All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow down all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Now it's rather interesting, that last line and the first line. The prosperous 
think because they're prosperous, they can control everything. Do you want to know something? Rich people die just as often as poor people die. Yeah, <laughs> once, one time, that's all it takes. Yeah, yeah, now they might have better medicine and better medical care and things of that nature, but rich people cannot control when they die. Now, why do I bring this up? Because it seems throughout the Bible that prosperous prosperity causes people to turn from the Lord. Um, you go to the book of Judges. Israel was seeking the Lord and was, 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 was hungering after the Lord, and the Lord gave them peace and gave them prosperity, and the economy was good, the crops were producing, and everything was easy for them. And what did they do? What was the first thing they did? They turned from the Lord. So the Lord sent an enemy to come in and conquer them and put them under captivity. And what did they do? They turned back to the Lord. And then things were prosperous again. And what did they do? They turned from the Lord. You know, it, it, it's, it's almost comical, the book of, Pro, of, of Judges. They call it the cycle of the Judges. And it goes over and over and over again in those three, four hundred years that the book of Judges lasted is that Israel would seek the Lord, the Lord would bless them, and prosperity would cause them to turn from the Lord, and then the Lord would cause affliction to come in their life, and they would seek the Lord. Maybe, people, maybe that's sometimes why we have affliction brought into our life is because it makes us dependent on the Lord. David specifically talks here about the prosperous. They can't control when they die even though they think they can. Bob and Joe were neighbors. Bob was poor, a poor farmer. Joe was a landlord. Bob used to be very relaxed and happy. He never bothered uh, to close the doors and windows of his house at night. He had deep, sound sleep. Although he had no money, he was peaceful. Joe used to be very tense always. He was very keen to close the doors and windows and lock his house up at night. He could not sleep very well. He was always bothered that somebody might break in and open his safes and steal away his money. He envied the peaceful Bob. One day, Joe called Bob and gave him a box full of cash, saying, Look, my dear friend, I am blessed with plenty of wealth. I find you in poverty, so take this cash and live in prosperity. Bob was overwhelmingly happy. He was joyful throughout the day, but then night came. Bob went to bed as usual. But today, he could not sleep. He went and closed the doors and windows. He still could not sleep. He began to keep on looking at the box of cash. The whole night, he was disturbed. As soon as day broke, Bob took the box of cash to Joe. He gave away the box to Joe, saying, Dear friend, I am poor, but your money took away peace from me. Please bear with me and take your money back. Isn't that an interesting story, huh? It was his prosperity that took his peace from him, caused him to wander away from a peaceful life. That happens in our life. It is our prosperity that can cause us to wander from the Lord. We get dependent on that rather than dependent on the Lord. All right, last point. Posterity, not prosperity. Posterity. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to the people yet unborn that he has done it. To the people yet unborn. Not only people in the church age are we to spread the gospel to the world, but it is also our responsibility to spread the gospel to the next generation. We need to make sure that the generation coming up hears the gospel as well. We're not responsible for two or three or four or five generations to come. We are only responsible for the next generation. Right now, downstairs, Nancy is teaching the kids Bible lessons, Bible stories, and Bible verses. I told Eunice that I was going to talk about her today in my sermon. Book of Timothy. Paul says, from a child, you have known the Holy Scriptures. Um, Timothy's dad was an uh, unsaved Greek. 
But Paul says also in the book of Timothy, he says, um, I'm paraphrasing, he says, I know where your faith came from, Timothy. It came from your faithful mother Lois and your grandmother Eunice. Their faith, that's where Eunice comes in here, their faith has affected your life. Can you just see Lois and Eunice teaching little Timothy from childhood stories about God's faithfulness? I had a wonderful time last night. Laurel had to work, but Isaac and Katie had a wedding. My son and daughter-in-law had a wedding. So they says, Grandpa, can you watch the girls? Yes, I can. And I got to have the grandkids last night. And before we went to, they went to bed, we hauled out a, a storybook, and we read about Noah and the ark and God's faithfulness there. And we read the story of creation and God's faithfulness there teaching their little minds at their age the scripture. We are responsible for passing the gospel on down to the generations yet unborn, the generations to come. Are we fulfilling that? All right, I'm done. 1101. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Application. After realizing the great blessings from the Lord, answered prayer, the my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Has gone away, and God has blessed us, and we recognize those blessings. How should we respond? Number one, we need to praise and thank him. Number two, we need to obey him. Number three, we need to spread his word to all the nations and our neighbor, and we need to spread his word to the next generation. Psalm 22 how well are you fulfilling the Lord's command? Let's bow in prayer. Father, thank you for this psalm. We looked last week at the prophecies of how Jesus had gone to the cross. Thank you, Father. And Father, we look at this week how, the, how you blessed David, and you blessed and heard the cry of the afflicted, and you were faithful Father, I pray that we might praise you, we might worship you, we might be obedient to you, and we might share your goodness, especially the goodness of salvation with others. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.